Welcome to our series, Church in History, Session 7. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. We're looking at church in history. One of the things to keep in mind now as we continue with our series is that Jesus, when he gave us the life, how to live as Christians, he really didn't found a church. What he really did, he established the need, the means of a church, but didn't found it. He knew it would have to develop in history. So what happens now, Paul comes along and Paul begins to say, how do we live with Jesus' message as a church, as a community? Jesus established a community of disciples. So now the community continues, but one of the things that Jesus told us is the idea that he was going to send the Holy Spirit, God. So the Holy Spirit was going to inspire. He said, the Holy Spirit will come, an advocate I'll be sending to you who will instruct you in all things. The Holy Spirit guided the church through its history and continues to guide the church through its history. So we believe that, that's part of our faith. But the reality is sometimes we forget that the Holy Spirit also is a spirit of wisdom, a spirit that's telling us how to respond to the needs of history that are happening in any particular time in history. So what happens is we look back now and we look at history, but always keeping in mind there's a guidance going on, an overarching help that we can't see with our eyes. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be perfect, but what it means is how does the church respond to history? How does the church survive as history moves forward and keeps changing? As we look back through history, we see that there were many great kingdoms that have fallen. We see there's many wonderful people who have died, but left behind them a heritage and a guidance on how to keep moving forward. So with that in mind, we're talking about the church in history. The idea the church is always moving along and responding to history under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We spoke about a major theologian back in the fourth century. His name is St. Augustine. St. Augustine, he wrote the confessions, the confessions that he's telling us about his life. He lived a promiscuous life when he was younger, but then he became a great saint. The reason he's so important to history is because he's one who has influenced the theology from the early church in the fourth century down to the 13th century. He's one who really had a tremendous influence on the thinking of the church. And then we recognize also there's another book by him called City of God. In the book, The City of God, he images two kinds of city. A city that is geared towards looking at God, responding to God, and a city of human beings where we are living in the world today. And so he begins to contrast these two cities. However, the value of Augustine is that it's a place in history where we see the Holy Spirit at work. Actually, what happened now too is back in those days, Augustine, like many great saints of his era, had to confront certain things that were not really in the scriptures. They really weren't written, written down. And so there were problems that arose that Jesus said nothing about and Paul said nothing about. One of those ideas, for instance, was the idea that after baptism, can sins be forgiven? And they had to go back into the scripture to find an answer to that question. There's many who said, no, that couldn't happen. 
finally, some began to say, well, yes, it could. But anybody who had certain powers within the church lost those powers. For instance, a bishop could no longer be a bishop, an ordained priest could no longer be an ordained priest. Because once they apostatized, once they denied Christ, they lost that power. They could still pray and live and worship, but they lost that power. And so a bishop in Carthage, he was ordained by a bishop who had apostatized. And there are others who are saying, no, it's not a valid ordination. Because that bishop lost his power to be able to ordain other bishops. Finally, Augustine went with a certain side way of thinking. He said, actually, the sacraments come not from the minister, but from Christ. Even if the minister is in sin, that sacrament comes down from Christ. In the case of the bishop, you don't lose those powers. They come from Christ. That answer is not directly in the scripture. So Augustine had to find the answer in scripture. Look through scripture, make an application to his own day. St. Augustine wrote other things. He wrote about original sin. Original sin is nowhere in the scripture, the word original sin. Augustine reasoned to it. But then Augustine was a theologian. He was one who had to keep using his mind, trying to reason to things, come up with, with the idea of under the guidance of the spirit, an answer. His answer was not completely correct. In fact, today, original sin is taught differently than it was in Augustine's day. And yet the reason is because nowadays or up until recently, looking back at the scriptures, they began to understand a different approach to the idea of sin, the sin of our first parents, whoever they might have been. So what happens is that we see how theology developed always under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and always developed, helped us to understand more clearly what, what was happening, what was the meaning of Christ's message as it applies to every ear. So the church then was caught in the middle of many of these controversies in early Christianity. But then what happened was, as we mentioned earlier, Rome fell about the year 410. In the year 410, people were shocked. Rome has fallen. The barbarians, they invaded Rome and they took over Rome. They killed many of the people. And so the invasion, the fall of Rome took place 410. And gradually, the church became the ruling party, not by anybody saying, well, let's make the church the rulers. No. The way it happened is that the church was actually the best organization able to take over the ruling of a territory and area. They were the best organized at the time. They began to help, never really realizing that they were helping to save the civilization of the West. They had a reputation of being a, a group that reaches out to those who are in need. They were very strong as a group to protect social justice. People knew this and their worship was balanced. Back in those days, again, there was so many ways of worshiping, pagan ways of worshiping that were very powerful, sometimes horrible. Christianity offered a very balanced way of worship. As far as the Pope in Rome went, the Pope at first was seen as someone like a guide. He was someone who could send out letters and guide people in their spiritual life. Then when certain countries began to have problems, theological problems, spiritual problems, they would ask the Pope to help them understand. In the beginning, they didn't say the Pope, once he spoke, was to be listened to and no doubts about it. So what happened was the Pope could guide them, but that's what he was, a guide. They didn't see the Pope as yet having any kind of jurisdictional power over them. Even Augustine. Augustine very often would send the things to the Pope asking certain questions, but he never showed, or at least 
seem to believe yet that the Pope had jurisdiction. He was a great spiritual guide, and that was his role at that time. But then the history kept changing. So now we have Augustine. He passes away, and shortly after that, a great Pope comes on the scene, Pope Leo the Great. He comes on the scene about the year 440. He rules for 20 years. They call him Leo the Great because he confronted many of the ideas of the era and he was able to share those, able to build on those. So what happens now? Leo the Great, he had an idea that the Pope had some jurisdictional power which meant that he had a power to pass laws or at least guidance for the church and that he was the leader, the spiritual leader of the church. He was Peter. He was speaking in the name of P Peter. So just as Peter led the apostles, so Leo saw the Pope as leading the church. And so he had to face certain things in his life. Some of them were theological, some were political, some were even warlike. But Leo was able to confront them all. He had a theological heresy, for instance, that happened in his own day. A theological idea about the present nature of God, of Jesus. What was Jesus like? Well, Jesus was, of course, human. But in another sense, he was divine. And so the teaching that Leo had to confront was that some said Jesus took a human humanity, but his divinity was so strong that it absorbed his humanity. Everything in Jesus' life was actually done by the second person of the Trinity. And so monophysitism. He had a human body to all appearances, but he really was God walking in their midst. He had one nature, a divine nature, not a human nature. It was a divine nature because it overtook the humanness. And this was a heresy. So they had to finally call a council. They called the Council of Chalcedon. So the Council of Chalcedon in 451, it now met to decide this issue. And <laughs> councils in those days apparently were much more combative than they are today. And what was happening there, there was a great feud in many ways. Some were saying, that's right, he, he has just one nature. Before Jesus came and when he was divine, there were two natures, divine and human. But once the divinity took over the humanness, the humanness almost disappeared. So there was just one divine nature. The Council of Chalcedon said, no, there are two natures in Jesus. It means that he was human and he was divine. There's one person, the one person, Jesus, son of God, second person of the Trinity. But there were two natures now. He had his human nature here on earth. It wasn't absorbed by the divine. So that was a heresy that arose around the time. And Leo, he wasn't able to attend the Council of Chalcedon. So he sent two delegates. He also sent what is called Leo's Tome, T-O-M-E. It's a document. And Leo's Tome declared that there are two natures in the one person of God. He declared this. And the fight went on. There was a man named Dioscorus who held, no, no, no. Jesus' divinity had to absorb his humanity. And when it finally came, they had a great discussion. It finally came down that someone was able to stand up and say, well, who are we going to follow? The Pope or Dioscorus? And so right away, the Eastern bishops especially, the bishops who were over across near Palestine, those areas, Constantinople, they were going with the idea of the one nature. 
the ones that were proposed, well, you're going to follow the Pope or this other man. And so they decided they were going to follow the Pope. So then they came out with the document, the document that said that there are two natures in the one person. Jesus is human and divine. So that was the idea that came out of Chalcedon. An interesting part about the idea of Chalcedon, the creed we pray today at the liturgy was finalized at Chalcedon. It was begun in 325 at the Council of Nicaea. But now it was finalized. They added more to it here, just to be sure to bring out the idea of the two natures in Jesus. And then at the end of the council, it was declared Peter has spoken. The view now was that the Pope spoke in the name of Peter. Pope Leo the Great is one of the great popes because he had now kind of sealed the idea that he represented Peter. Before he became Pope, there were some popes who tried to defend the idea and bring up the idea and support the idea that the Pope was speaking in the name of Peter. But Pope Leo, because of his greatness, because of his strength, was able to speak in the name of Peter. So what happened now? is that things began to change. People began to look at the papacy a little differently. One of the other things that Pope Leo had to do, because Pope Leo was also the most powerful person in Rome, really almost the government of Rome, there was a threat from a Hun, a barbarian tribe. Attila the Hun was the leader. They were going to invade Rome. And there was no hope because Rome had no strong army to protect against it. So the Pope, completely unarmed, Leo went out to confront Attila. Whatever was said, no one knows. Whatever the, whatever the negotiations were, nobody knows. However, somehow or other, Leo was able to talk Attila the Hun out of invading Rome. And so Leo saved Rome. This, this raised his popularity a great deal. People saw how he saved. They were worried. They were scared. Because what happens is in those days, whenever there was an invasion, people were killed and then carried off into slavery. So he saved the city. But then a few years later, there was another threat a threat from a group called the Vandals. In our current day, we have the word vandalism. It comes from that group. The idea that they went and they destroyed and they killed, vandalism. And so what happens now is again, Leo has to go out and confront them. And Leo, he meets them right near Rome. And he's trying to talk them out of it, but he couldn't. But what he did do, he received an agreement from them. They would sack Rome. They would take Rome's treasures. They would destroy some parts of Rome, maybe all of Rome, if they could. But they wouldn't bother the people. They wouldn't kill the people. So at least that was a concession. So he was able to bring that about. Leo the Great is great because of his political insights, because of his theological insights. He was really a brilliant person, charismatic in many ways, strong, brave. He was one who really gave himself to leading the church. So he now was seen as the really the political and spiritual leader of the church. That was his role right now as seen by the people. He was seen as the visible head of the church. The people now considered the Pope to be head of the church. It didn't happen from Jesus or Paul. They had no idea of anybody challenging the idea of the leadership. They had no idea of the need to have someone say, well, this is what leadership is. They didn't recognize 
how the political powers of the time would begin to infringe upon the church. And so they needed something. In fact, Leo recovered the phrase Supreme Pontiff. He took that upon himself, Supreme Leader. And he introduced that into the papacy. The idea behind that, it used to be used sometimes for the emperors. But he used it that way to show that he speaks in the name of Peter. And so as Peter... He shares the message of Christ with the church. So Leo then is called Leo the Great. Leo the Great, 440 to 466. He led the church, 461, excuse me. So he led the church and he brought the church into a whole new era, which is why they called him Leo the Great. So then as time went on, or as time was going on, about five years after the death of Leo, the Franks were beginning to show some power. The Franks actually, that was a group. It's called the Franks. The group was called Franks, country people, but they weren't united. They were tribes, many different tribes. And they were tribes which were now in a place of Gaul, which eventually became France. There were no countries yet. There were no really national countries yet existed in Europe. It was the Roman Empire and that was it. So we're ahead of our times here. The nationalities, the countries did not yet exist. But Clovis was the leader of the Franks, a group in the Franks, almost like warlords. And he married a Christian woman. And so he heard some ideas about Christianity. But then as a leader of one of the groups that he had, they were going to go into a battle. It looked like he was going to be defeated. The battle of the enemy looked so strong. But he prayed to the God of his wife, the Christian God. And he won the battle. And Clovis, he saw this as a sign of God working through him with him. He saw God as guiding his troops, helping him to win that battle. He continued to be a warlord. But what he did, he began to conquer other groups. He began to conquer other groups among the Franks. And the way he did it, he always made sure that the groups he was going to attack were weaker than his group. So he attacked the weaker groups and then kept absorbing them into his group. And gradually, he did so many. He became a very powerful leader of the Franks. He united many of these different people, these different groups. And so he's pulling the Franks together. And so he eventually, as many leaders did in those days, became involved again in the church. He prayed, he knew about the church. The church actually had grown fairly powerful throughout the empire. And so what does he do? He starts to take to himself some of the powers of the church. He appoints bishops. He sees this as part of the power of any ruler. The ruler has a right to appoint bishops. So he's going to appoint bishops. And so that's what happens. And in this way, he's accepted by the church. Oh, okay, he's appointing bishops. But at the same time, it's gradually leading up to a problem that the church will have with the governments in its own day. In the meanwhile, while Clovis is doing all this, the church, Christianity, it's spreading. And one of the ways it's spreading, an important way, is through the Irish monks. Early in our history, we began to talk about the monastic movement. The monastic movement seemed like, well, it's a nice spiritual movement, but actually it was a movement that really affected Europe deeply. East and West, it affected the whole empire deeply. It was the monasteries that really brought about major conversions. There was a group, the Irish monks. The Irish monks, were for the most part, of course, part of Ireland, 
And Ireland was really spared a great deal of these invasions. An island off by itself in many, many viewpoints. And what was happening there, we know about St. Patrick. St. Patrick converted many of the people on the island. But what he did it, the way he did it, was setting up monasteries. And the monasteries did the converting. 50 years after he died, the Irish monks were now a missionary groups. They were sending them out to Europe. So they were monks staying together in monasteries, but they began a new kind of movement. And the movement was that they began to reach out to the world. They went out in groups. There's even some who say that the Irish, St. Brendan, reached the shores of America. They were considered to be a missionary group at that time. There are many legends about some of the Irish. There's a great saint, a woman saint, St. Bridget. She founded monasteries, a very holy person. She found what is called a, a shared monastery, the idea being a dual monastery. She founded one for men, one for women. And so they followed a very strict rule. But the monks were really the ones who now began to go throughout the world. So the monastic movement was now spreading. They would set up a monastery in an area. Others would come, not just the Irish, but others began to expand to other countries. And others would come and settle around it. They would lead eventually to perhaps cities. What the Irish did, they introduced the idea of individual confession. So up until this point, if people had sins to confess, they would pray, but the really serious sins had to be shown in public, had to be confessed in a sense by community penance, sometimes lasting a few years. Any sin, adultery or along those lines, would always have to be a public penance. So now the Irish come and they begin to have individual secret confessions. Part of the idea too, many feel, is that actually these confessions began by spiritual direction, began by the monks directing people in their life how to live close to Christ. Eventually, within that con con uh, sharing, would come the confession of sins. Also during this era, there was a development in liturgy. The liturgy, for instance, back in those days, were liturgies that would ha have the idea that they were beginning to come the same, but each country changed it a little bit, add th added things. At the Second Vatican Council, after when they redid the liturgy, there were certain customs that came from countries. The Pope or a leading prelate in that country would become Pope and introduce what was happening in his country. And so some of the things that were found in the Eucharistic liturgy before the Council were part of what was found in a country that a Pope came from. Excuse me. One of the things we are commonly familiar with is the word mass. Around the sixth century, that word came into being, mass. It referred to the Eucharistic liturgy. The word mass actually comes from the last words that people heard at liturgy in Latin. It was ita missa est. Ita missa est. It means you are sent. So it really was called the scent because it was the last word that people heard. And they'd say, are you going to the Missa? Are you going to the scent? But actually what was happening, the word now became mass. And so mass became a common expression used by many people. The West, it spoke in Latin in the liturgies. It became standardized. It actually was already used in different forms in different places. But about the sixth century, it became more standardized. In the East, there was more mystery in their way of worship. They would have the first part of their liturgy, some of the worshiping ways of the liturgy in the East, 
they would have the regular liturgy of the word, perhaps we could say, not exactly the way we have it today, but they would have a liturgy of sharing the word. And then when that was finished, a curtain would be drawn so that they couldn't see what was happening beyond the curtain, almost an imitation of the Holy of Holies. And behind the curtain is where the consecration would take place. So it was different. It had to develop in time. The East kept alive the idea of mystery. Mystery, not in the sense of a murder mystery, it's something to figure out, but the idea of touching something with a great spiritual meaning. So that was the emphasis. It followed the culture. The East was very strong on the mystery part of religion. They were more involved, for instance, of someone's philosopher like Plato, someone who really influenced the idea that there are two worlds and very strongly influenced the sacredness of the spiritual world. So those are all the things that are going on together. The reason I'm doing it that way is because I don't want to give the idea that one thing led to the other and then to the other. The world was a big world. Things were going on in one section, other sections, only in time, in travel, in trade, etc., were they coming together. Always under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's what we believe as Christians, that the Holy Spirit was always at work. Sometimes we think the Spirit is affecting the individual person. But the Holy Spirit can affect all of history. The Spirit doesn't force. The Spirit guides. What that means is that we can can't say, well, the reason we're doing this is because the Spirit wanted us to, so we were inspired to do it exactly this way. No, the Spirit also worked with history, the good and bad points of history. So we have to keep that in mind, is that there were good and bad people. And history had to work to try to keep the church moving in the right direction throughout history. So also history continues. We now move on a few more years to 527. 527, Emperor Justinian. He comes along. And it's 15 years after Clovis. And what happens now, he works with the idea of the empire. He's now the emperor in the east. In 476, the emperor in the west was destroyed, deposed. So there is no emperor in the west. But now the emperor, a single emperor, as the whole empire. He did try, or they did try rather before him. They did try to have another emperor in the West to kind of guide the people, but that didn't work. They were very weak emperors in the West. So we don't even hear too much about them. But now Justinian, the sole emperor, and he decides to restore the glory of the empire. He wants to bring about the union of the East and the West. And so what happens is that he now has this fight on his hands. The West is being invaded and losing. The East is not being invaded as strongly, but invasions are still going on. The barbarians, as they call them. But the West was really being invaded strongly. Many battles going on there. So. Justinian decided to send some troops to fight against the invasions. Troops cost money. He had to tax the people heavily. The people in the East were taxed heavily. And so the people in the East were beginning to be unhappy with the situation. They had resentment against the West. It weakened the Eastern defenses. Because what Justinian had to do was to take some of his defenses and send them to defend the West. So finally, when the Germanic tribes invaded the eastern section, the people were very resentful. And the people also had become very weak. And so some of the tribes, even though they weren't as strong as the invasions in the West, were still on the doorstep of the East. The church in the East 
and the empire in the east. So what happened under Justinian? Justinian, he tried to expand the empire. That was one thing, but he did other things too. He wanted to guide the church. He wanted to weaken paganism as much as he could. He even wrote a code, the Justinian Code. A code is like a, a ruler. It rules. It puts the parameters around things. So he has these parameters in which he works, the laws. What he did, he closed the pagan schools. It was still schools that were teaching paganism. He closed those schools. He made the Christians, any Christians, mainly the clergy, rulers. They were the judges. Life became very difficult for the Jews. The Jews were kind of a strange situation for the Jews in the, in the empire. The Jews were the only ones who were allowed to lend money. Christianity was completely against what they call usury. They, Christians were not allowed to loan money at, at interest. The Jews were. When Christians needed money, they would go to the Jewish people, the Jewish loaners, and get money from them. They put themselves in debt financially. And so they used them this way, but eventually the debts apparently were piling up too much. And so when they turned against the Jews, if they could get some of the Jews out of their way, that would save them from having to repay what they had borrowed. But at the same time, there was a strong prejudice against Jews. So under Justinian, many of the Jews found it difficult. There was no law that said they were allowed to kill Jews or go after Jews. However, the people did this. There was a prejudice that really wasn't checked too much. So the people themselves on the Justinian Code, they were pressured to convert to Christianity. Many people became Christians. They were forced, in a sense, under pressure to become Christians. Under Clovis, when Clovis captured a group, he very often forced them to become Christians. Excuse me. But now what happened is that now the pressure by simply making life difficult for other people led to conversions. After Justinian died, weak, weak emperors followed. In fact, three years after he died, Italy was lost. The changing face of the map of Europe. Again, they weren't nations yet. In the meanwhile, again, as I said, the monasteries were really helping so much throughout Europe. They were helping individual areas. They weren't united in the sense of a battle group. They were simply helping because they could reach out to the people in some way. So many people, they wanted to go to the monasteries. Again, as I mentioned, they gathered around the monasteries, sometimes their protection was the monasteries. When there was an invasion, they could run to the monasteries that very often were walled in. This was the protection against the invading barbarians. But many of the monasteries at that time were becoming very austere. They were very, very strict. Many of the monks were becoming sick. So what happened was they really wanted to have a more lenient monastery. Benedict, he went out and he was a monk who was out in the desert praying. And the word got around that many of his followers, they were people who would come out to receive spiritual direction from him. And there was a monastery nearby. The monks there went to him for spiritual guidance and they wanted him to become their abbot. So he accepted. But then after several years, they wanted to kill him. He was too austere. 
he was too much of a person who would make their life difficult simply by following rules. He had the idea of the monastery should be organized in some way. He finally had to flee. flee. They tried to poison him, but that didn't work. And actually, the jealous clergy in the area, they helped spark that a little bit. They wanted to get rid of him. So he went and he established his own monastery at Monte Cassino. Monte Cassino is an area between Naples and Italy itself. So Monte Cassino became a very famous monastery. And he set down rules for the day. One of the famous slogans for St. Benedict in Latin is ora et labora, means prayer and work. He set up a day of prayer, many hours in prayer, manual labor, and also spiritual reading. He believed in the spiritual development of the monks. And the order of the day was something we would find very austere today, perhaps. But it was one that was really well balanced in those days compared to what the monks put upon themselves without a rule. Monte Cassino eventually was invaded, destroyed. It had become a well-known place, but people wanted some of the wealth that was gradually growing there. So they had to flee, and they set it up in another area. Monte Cassino, the monastery kept going. But also what was happening in the meanwhile is that people were beginning to find St. Benedict's rule, an orderly monastery monastic rule, how to live your day as a member, how as a monk. And so they lived their day as a monk. And they followed an order. It began to spread the idea of Benedict's rule. And others began to pick it up. And they were all independent. They didn't depend upon each other. They all chose their own abbot. And so it wasn't a link in the sense of saying, well, Benedict found this whole group. And they were all coming together and uh, formed an order. No. The idea they were all independent and they followed their own rules. They all had the same rule. But this rule began to spread. And St. Benedict is called the patriarch of the monk monasteries, patriarch of the monks, because he changed the way the monks lived. He gave order to their way of living. And so what was happening now, we begin to see how many things, again, in different areas are developing under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, a little bit here, a little bit there, but it's all going to come together as history goes on. Time goes on and we come to another great Pope, Pope Gregory. They call him Gregory the Great. Gregory the Great, he was about um, 150 years after the election of Leo. So Leo was elected 150 years earlier, Pope Leo the Great. Now we have Pope Gregory the Great. He was from a highly respected family before he became uh, uh, ordained. Well-educated. He was a good leader. He had great leadership qualities. People recognized him for his great leadership qualities. Before he was made Pope, he shaped government policies. He was in the midst of the political scene. He had great concern for the poor, especially the poor in Rome. So he was someone who reached out and continued to reach out to the poor. After the death of his father, his mother had already passed away. After the death of his father, he felt a yearning to become a monk. So he turned the family mansion into a monastery. And they wanted to elect him as the abbot, but he refused. He wanted to be an ordinary monk. Finally, he was a, spent years in the monastery, a few years. But now the Pope needed help. And the Pope recognized Gregory's great power. 
So he commanded Gregory to come and help with the government. The Pope chose him and the Pope trusted him. But then what happened with Gregory is that the Pope finally died and the people wanted him to become Pope. In those days, very often, a Pope was not elected by any kind of a conclave or any group of cardinals coming together. The people of the town could elect the Pope. The Pope of Rome, the Bishop of Rome, was made Pope. And so people recognized that. So what they wanted to do was to make Gregory the Bishop of Rome. And he tried to flee, tried to run away. Finally, he gave in. He was well prepared for his office. He had all this experience, deep spirituality, strong faith, courage. He had all these things, a great deal of experience, great deal of concern for the poor, very spiritual person. So it all came together in this Gregory, Gregory the Great. He actually was Pope from 590 to 604. One of the things he did, he strengthened the papacy. Leo had started to do it, but there was still some who objected to this idea of the Pope being over the whole of the Christianity. So what happened was he strengthened it. Gregory strengthened it. He confronted the Bishop of Constantinople. The Bishop of Constantinople saying, well, I'll concede. I'll say the Pope is the head of the church, but then the Bishop of Constantinople the second over all the others. Gregory didn't like the idea of anybody else being over all the others. And so he confronted him. And again, they had to develop an idea how the church is meant to continue. He was able to prove that he himself was the sole pope. He had a strong power over the bishops. He challenged the bishops to live as good shepherds. He had them fight heresies. He demanded obedience from them. And he demanded that they be faithful. And one of the things that was lacking is that the education of the ordained priest was not that good. Many of them came almost from their own area and were chosen by the people and weren't educated at all. So now he set up schools to prepare for priesthood. He wrote extensively, tremendous energy. He wrote treatises on the Bible, life, Christian life, on the clergy. He had a great love for liturgy, Gregorian chant. So he had an influence on Gregorian chant. He really didn't write Gregorian chant. But what he did, he had them gather together all the chants or many of the chants. He saved the chants. Plus, there was others done by other people. But he himself probably didn't do too much in that direction. But he did do a great deal. He prayed and he really encouraged the music of Gregorian chant. Again, the mission to church to the poor. He kept going back to that. He founded monasteries like Benedict, but in a different way. The Benedict. He sent missionaries to other countries. So what happens now is we see that the church is moving on. The church is developing. And as it's developing, it's because of some of the great men in history. They were part of the historical development. Things were going on in different parts of the empire, but the great people who God sent, great leaders, are really those who saved the church and actually might have saved Europe, might have saved civilization. And so we see all these things and say, the spirit is still at work. The church in history. So the history determined what the needs were. God sent the helpers. God guided those who were bringing civilization, Christianity, to the world. Next week, we'll continue, or well, next session, we'll continue with the idea of how the church continued to grow and say a few more words about Gregory the Great.
May the light of Christ lead me. The power of Christ be with me. The wisdom of Christ inspire me. The word of Christ instruct me. The shelter of Christ protect me. The hand of Christ hold me. And the love of Christ be in me. May the grieving find support in me. The sad find joy in me. The depressed find hope in me. The weak find strength in me. The doubters find faith in me. The rejected find love in me. And the world find Christ in me. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.